Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. In this episode, Lars Jensen, lead developer at GoTo, chats about the cloud native and Kubernetes ecosystem with Casper Neeson, lead platform architect at Lunar, and Frederick Monson and Lasse Hoiga, both software pilots at Trifork. Created for developers by developers, GoTo gathers the best minds in the software community. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in Chicago, Amsterdam, and Copenhagen, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Welcome, all three of you. I'm here in Aarhus. Uh, we just finished go to Aarhus last week, and I have the pleasure of sitting here with three of our speakers from the conference. We have uh, Kasper Nissen, Frederik Monsen, and Lasse Heugram. Um, thank you very much for coming here to spend some time with me. Uh, and I was hoping that we could do a quick round of introductions. So if you would start, Lasse. Yeah, sure. Uh, Lasse Heugram, I work at Trifork. Um, I do cloud infrastructure and I do backend development uh, infrastructure, architecture, stuff like that. I'm a certified Kubernetes administrator, as you guys also are, I guess, um, it, unless it, it expired. <laughs> uh, and I've been working with uh, Cloud Native and Kubernetes for, I don't know, three years, I would say. Before that, I worked in uh, something that wanted to be Cloud Native, but, but had some regulatory issues, let's say that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm Frederick. And I work at uh, Trifor Public, uh, doing mainly cloud and security and infrastructure um, for big big health uh, setup in, in Denmark at the moment. Cool. My name is Casper. Um, I work as the lead platform architect at Luna. Um, we are a sort of a fintech turned bank. Got a banking license a year and a half ago, uh, something like that, and just been building a cloud native bank ever since. I also am a Cloud Native Computing Foundation ambassador, which means that I spend some time during work and, and, and in my spare time uh, organizing meetups. And we, we sort of uh, created this, um, we call it a meetup alliance uh, across the, the Nordic countries, uh, Cloud Native Nordics. And, and we basically just try to help each other out with organizing meetups. Um, we just before COVID hit, we had some, some road shows where we were sort of sending speakers across uh, different cities. So it's, it's basically just trying to help each other out as much as possible. And yeah, I work a lot with, with Kubernetes and all cool cloud native uh, technology in, in my sort of day to day job at, at Lunar as well and can build the platform there. Okay. That's interesting. Um, so I brought a few questions with me from home just to sort of get the conversation flowing, but feel free to jump in and derail things whenever you see fit. Uh, um, so my first question is a bit of an introduction to people who might not know too much about Kubernetes. Um, so what I'm wondering is, is cloud native the same as Kubernetes? My gut feeling is that cloud native is a bit of an older term. Kubernetes is a bit of a newer term, but these days I feel like I can't see one without the other. Uh, and it feels like Kubernetes has sort of become synonymous with, with cloud native. So what, what is your take on that? Is there a difference or are they actually the same now? <laughs> that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I think that so cloud native, the, the term cloud native is, uh, and, and the cloud native computing foundation is a foundation that are sort of hosting a lot of different projects. One of them being Kubernetes. Um, so if you are, I guess if you're using, let's say Prometheus as a monitoring tool and, and, and other different cloud native, uh, projects, you can probably be cloud native without actually being sort of, uh, without Kubernetes. Um, but there's a lot of sort of in the definition of, of being cloud native, there's a, some, some things that you are sort of doing in a, in a way you're, you're doing containers most like you, you are orchestrating these containers, you're running microservices. So you probably need something like Kubernetes in there to actually deal with all of that <laughs> because that's, there's a lot of things when you're running microservices, you need a way to actually orchestrate and, and manage those microservices. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be Kubernetes though. Like it, before we had Kubernetes, we had uh, Mesos or we had Docker Swarm. And now I see that, uh, that Nomad is also picking up Steam, mm -hmm. which is another uh, container orchestrator. So I think that Kubernetes is, is the most popular one and it's yeah. the most obvious choice for a lot of people, but, but it's not the only container orchestrator. Mm -hmm. And I think that is like a strength uh, in the cloud native space that 
we have these tools and we have these concepts of, a, on a, of an orchestrator. And we have a concrete implementation, which is Kubernetes, which is really, really good, but it's not the only one. And we can sort of switch that out. Um, and if you have, if you don't have the need for the thing that Kubernetes are good at, well, go for something else. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's also what the, the CNCF is, is trying to provide. It's, it's providing options for, for different uh, problems out there. And as a different, mo in, in many cases, there are, are multiple different projects that can solve some of the same uh, things in, in the ecosystem and, and the projects that are hosted within the CNCF. Not, not container orchestration. Uh, that, that's probably something they're missing, but, but Kubernetes is maybe a sort of a standard that we are, a de facto standard at least we are sort of building on top of in, within the cloud native really, ecosystem as yes. it is right now. But yeah. yes, you can choose uh, other solutions. I, I guess Docker Swarm is still out there. <laughs> it's still around. Yeah. You see it somewhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, in Denmark at least, Kubernetes is definitely the, the go to tool for both for new projects and for projects that have been for, for a longer time. Um, but we do see other orchestrators around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it's also, I think that because all the big clouds, they have a managed Kubernetes offering, it, it makes it easy for you to go to Kubernetes. I don't know if anybody has a managed Nomad offering, I, probably, but I, I don't think that Google offers one. I don't think Amazon offers one, but they do for, for, for Kubernetes. And that gives you this, uh, agility in theory to move clouds. Um, and yeah, I think that's also a strength and that I think that makes Kubernetes a good choice, uh, that you can run it anywhere basically. Uh, and you can get some people to run it for you. Uh, exactly. And, and also what we've been sort of seeing over the past couple of years with the introduction of custom resources in Kubernetes is that we are sort of extending Kubernetes to, to more than what Kubernetes was in the beginning, right? So we are. We, we sort of standard, standardized around Kubernetes and we are now building on top of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is, has become this thing that we sort of, in most cases, put in the, in the middle. Um, and we sort of build our platforms on, on top of Kubernetes. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's really been a revolution that we, we have an API that is so well defined and at the same time so extensible that you can just, just about extend it to anything. Uh, that's really, really, that's really a, one of the big differentiators of Kubernetes right now, also compared to the other container orchestrators, they, they can't do that. No. Um, maybe we should uh, elaborate on what <laughs> custom resource definition and like, extensive API like means. For, yeah, I think, I think that's a good idea. So if you, could, if you could just put a few words to what's a custom resource definition. Yeah, so uh, in, in Kubernetes, we, we have the, the native Kubernetes resources of how you actually run an application or you get some configuration into an application or whatever it might be. There's native resources that are sort of within Kubernetes. Yeah, you can almost think of them as, as types in a programming language. Yeah, exactly. And then, then you have the, the option to add, add your own custom resources. Like um, an example could be that I want an... Postgres SQL instance that are managed somewhere else or something like that, then I can create a custom resource saying this is a Postgres SQL instance. And then you have something that are sort of doing this uh, for you, applying this for you. Um, but it could be many different things. Uh, the, the operator sort of framework and pattern that are sort of very popular these days in, within this ecosystem is that you build some kind of, uh, you have this custom resource that are uh, how you, uh, sort of the, the options that you want to um, to give to your customers. And then you have an operator, some kind of uh, software code reconciliation group that are doing some stuff, uh, managing a, an application or rolling knows how to update, a, I don't know, a distributed a system running on top of Kubernetes or whatever it might be. It, it can be anything, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, I think it's a good good definition. Um, yeah, and, and, and the... When you define this custom resource definition, you define, you define basically the structure or the, the options that you want to expose. So that's, uh, that's the schema of the custom resource definition that you expose to the end user. And then you have the operator that is operating on the resource and, and yes, uh, sort of instrumenting it or, uh, yeah, running it. Yeah. And one of the, the most powerful parts of this is that this is exactly the same way that Kubernetes is doing everything as well. Yeah. Right. So you have the native resources, as you said, and the custom resources. And from the, from the user's point of view, it doesn't really matter if I'm interacting directly with Kubernetes or with some 
uh, extension that I added to Kubernetes using these custom resources or using uh, an operator from whatever company. Uh, the workflow is the same and the, the the endpoints I can use to take out metrics, the endpoints I can use to see if everything is running as expected is, uh, is the same and is consolidated for both the Kubernetes native applications and controllers, resources, and the extensions that I add in. Yeah, so so if you're familiar with something like uh, with Kube Control or Kube Cuddle or whatever sort of <laughs> side you're on here in terms of naming and, and using Kube Control, but I, I just call it Kube Control. So you say Kube Control get parts, you can say Kube Control get databases or get uh, users or whatever. It's uh, you are just extending Kubernetes to to be whatever you sort of want it to be. Yeah, and, and we see that taken to the extreme with something like Cluster API now where you, inside Kubernetes, you define a custom resource that is uh, the specification for running clusters. So you can say, I want a cluster, and then you apply that information to one Kubernetes cluster that has the custom resource definition. Then inside that cluster is running an operator that will then go and create a custom a, a Kubernetes cluster for you in whatever cloud or whatever environment you're running in. And that is like mind-blowing. That you're, <laughs> taking it into you're, you're running something in a cluster that is creating other clusters using the same API that yeah, that everybody uses. That's, that's really, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, I, I saw, I heard of a project. Uh, I can't remember the name right now. Maybe we'll put that in the notes. Um, but they actually took out, they took out the base resources from Kubernetes. They, so they removed parts and they removed deployments and removed services, they removed everything besides custom resource definitions. So you just have the API server. You don't have any controllers besides the API server, basically. Uh, and then, okay, so I want to run a cluster where I can run parts. So you apply the custom resource definition for a part and a deployment. So you have a base layer that's almost uh, as minimal as it can be. Then you plug in whatever you want. Mm. Um, I'll see if I can find, it, find a link for it later. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. Be able to sort of select the features of Kubernetes that you want to use and, and put your own in there as well. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you want to have completely stateless clusters so you don't you don't apply the daemon set or the stateful set resource at all. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, that's interesting. Do, do you think that's one of the reasons why Kubernetes has become so popular? That is like the extensibility of it and how you can tweak it to your needs? I think it became popular before these uh, custom resources were really a big thing, before changing uh, Kubernetes was, was one of the things that people did. Um, why it became the most popular one is uh, is difficult to say. Yeah, we had we had the container wars or container orchestrator wars back in yes. two thousand and what seventeen something like that uh, with Mesos and uh, Docker Swarm and Kubernetes being some the the, the, the competitors in, in that war. Um, I think the the community and just uh, is something that that sort of help flip some the coin for, for Kubernetes is that we, there's a really, really, really big community behind Kubernetes. And uh, it all, there also was back then. And then sort of this open, open uh, vendor neutral um, theme that the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is sort of um, pioneering is, is, is something that is really applicable to many. Um, it's a... Uh, it, yeah, it's that, that. Yeah, I think community is, is a, a big thing why Kubernetes actually won this because Docker Swarm that we had a the, the, the big D Docker uh, the company uh, behind they needed to make money, um, so that's probably why they sort of uh, went away again. Uh, many hated when they sort of put in Docker Swarm into the Docker daemon. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was probably why the Docker Swarm didn't didn't win that war. And in terms of Mesos and um, I think maybe complexity, um, it was really really um, at scale companies that were using Mesos back then. So maybe it was yeah not sort of the right solution for yeah. But all it was almost too abstract. Like you just had a bunch of resources and you wanted to run workloads on them. But I think you you actually needed to bring your own. Controller, if you wanted to actually run the workloads, then yeah, you uh, needed like bring, bring your own scheduler, a scheduler on yeah. top or whatever it might be that you want one. And, and yeah. Kubernetes came with one per default, so it was sort of easier to get running, I guess. Yeah, but was, this, this was before I started using Kubernetes. It was tailored to to Docker and Docker the, the momentum behind running Docker and, and sort of Dockerizing and containerizing your applications was probably also 
so now we have dog on saying this. We don't maybe don't need a, a big system that can deploy binaries and, and cron jobs or whatever Mesos also did. So Kubernetes was just built for, for, for Docker uh, containers, right? And that maybe also have a, had an effect back then. Yeah, yeah. Mesos had the opportunity or ability to, to not run Docker containers. They could run any kind of workloads. Uh, yeah. I think it was a good idea to standardize on running Docker containers. I, I believe. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> the verdict's still out. Uh, one of the one of the things I find very interesting here is that uh, all of the different points we just mentioned, uh, why Kubernetes is awesome, right? With managed clusters and extendability and uh, uniform APIs that can do everything. And these are all the specific reasons why Hashicorp says we should use Nomad because it doesn't have all that stuff. Uh, because Nomad is a single binary, you can run it everywhere by yourself. You don't need to have managed clusters. There's no big extensibility setup that makes everything uh, difficult and complex to do. It's just scheduling workloads on when you nodes. And it is both Docker containers and not Docker containers for Nomad at least. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see in the future if you'll go towards a more uh, simplifies setup again, at least for all the not really huge projects that actually need to be able to extend. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there is a lot of complexity in running Kubernetes and getting it running and keeping it running and upgrading it. There's a lot of complexity in that. Um, Definitely. Yeah, but that's also changed, right? Because that's what the cloud providers are trying to take care of for you. Uh, it, it was really complex in the beginning when you had to do everything the hard way. It's uh, because how Hightower created the, the hard way uh, repo. Um, but nowadays it, it's, it's basically just clicking a button in AWS or Google Cloud or whatever, and you have a cluster and they manage the control plane for you, or even maybe the, the worker nodes as well. And, and you just need to put in how many worker nodes do I need and what type of instance should they be? So it's just become a lot easier to run a Kubernetes cluster because of the yeah the managed services that is provided for you yeah. at least as long as you want it to run in a public cloud provider right yeah exactly if uh, if you want to run it on your own hardware or you want to run it uh, on a point of sale systems in a shop or whatever then it becomes yeah, interesting and difficult again right yeah it, it does yeah but i think it's interesting that the more that the cloud providers they can provide for us as managed services or as you said like nomad this is more simplified way of running container workloads. Uh, do I, as a as a end user of a cluster, do I really care that I'm running in a cluster? I might because I need to take that into consideration when I'm designing my application. How do I handle failures? How do I handle logging? But in the end, I don't really care that I'm running Kubernetes. I just want to run my app, right? Uh, yeah. So that's, I think, something that we try to do as infrastructure or platform teams, try to, to abstract away the Kubernetes clusters in some way Yes. Because if you just, if you just in, in quotation marks, if you're just a, a backend developer, you want to run a service on a pod, uh, well, go ahead. You don't need to care about what region am I in necessarily. What, what is my underlying container orchestrator? Uh, yeah, I think it doesn't matter, right? I mean, when I do applications in my free time, I don't use Kubernetes. I just throw the container at Heroku, right? <laughs> go make run Heroku. <laughs> they'll handle some sort of orchestrator behind that. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. So that's serverless basically <laughs> yeah. for you. Yeah, that's that's also <clears throat> what we've been building at, at Lunar as well. Is is that we we sort of put in an abstraction there um, because developers really don't need to care about not even Docker files maybe uh, mm-hmm. because in in most cases at least at uh, at Lunar we we are Go shop, so it it's the same way that we build a, a Docker container and. and if you sort of put that over to the developer, they also need to know what is best practices for actually building a Docker container. Do not run root or as, as the root user and, and all of that, right? So, and do you really want to put that responsibility onto the developer or is that something you as a platform um, provide as a service for the developers? Right. Um, so that's at least what we, we sort of try to do both in terms of Docker files, but also in terms of uh, Kubernetes manifest and best practices for how you actually write a, a manifest. But, yeah, I think that, that's an interesting point because like now we've standardized on Kubernetes as the de facto runtime for running workloads in a cloud or on premise. Uh, and now <laughs> in all companies, we have these platform teams and they are now building abstractions on top of that. And, and we're, we're now uh, diversifying what it means to run an application. So you know, you have one definition of what it means to run an application on top of Kubernetes. 
uh, and in other companies they may, might have another. So now we see this this uh, very very diverse set of what is an application, how do I run it on Kubernetes? Because we want to abstract away the complexity. So and I see it's now diverging in, in all sorts of directions. And then maybe in a few years it will probably converge again, and we will now have a standaway. So this is an app. Like, yeah. I, I think that, that a lot of companies are building their own platforms uh, yeah. as it is right now. And that's probably because the, the right solution is probably has not yet been built, maybe to sort of the sort of embraces all of these different aspects of, uh, of running in a cloud native ecosystem, because there's a lot of things that you need to take care of. Uh, we have like the, the, the cloud native landscape, which is, uh, I don't know, a thousand projects or something like that, right? Mm. If you need a platform where you can actually sort of hook in, Whatever you need as a as an organization, I um, perhaps we need uh, yeah logging from a specific vendor or or something else. And we need we need a, we need a platform that uh, where we can plug in the different solutions for the different problems that we're trying to solve. And and we haven't probably not seen that platform out there yet. Mm -hmm. um, at least we haven't found anything that we sort of see. We, we can we can use this and, and and build on top of that. But and but yeah, we, we chose Kubernetes for that, um, and and just build on on top of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes for us is, is sort of the foundation that we build on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, one one of the themes that I'm picking up from your discussion here is that Kubernetes might be more of a tool to build platforms on, rather than, let's say, I'm a developer at home doing a hobby project, and it's probably overkill, right? Um, Unless I'm there, <laughs> unless I'm doing it to learn, right? So if, if you are in that position that you're a developer on a small project wanting to pick up some of these skills, um, is Kubernetes the right way? Uh, I think you mentioned before that Kubernetes is just one implementation of a container orchestration platform. Are there others that are more suited to that kind of um, situation? Yeah, maybe. Um, so that, that would lead us to the, to the serverless um theme or um what do you call it concept um because kubernetes is very very low level in a sense like you're still building a platform you still need to bring all these things that you that the platform doesn't come with uh, and if you want to do you just you just want to run a dark container so go for something serverless go for cloud run or aws lambda or fargate or whatever um because if you just have an http service uh, listening on a some port, logging to standard out. That's okay. Just run the service and uh, scale it for me and do do the magic. Uh, I think Kubernetes in some ways is too low level for those kind of workloads. Like you said, you mentioned Heroku, right? Heroku is the the, the old uh, serverless offering, or you know, Google App Engine is also a serverless offering. Yeah, I think the the problem with those types of, of the services is that they are you need to sort of create your application and, and sort of make it fit with the, whatever runtime they are sort of running. I think the abstraction of having and, and building your own containers and just using that uh, for some platform, uh, you mentioned Fargate or what's it called, serverless instances uh, on Ada, in, in Azure and Google has something as well, uh, where you just cloud run. Uh, cloud run. Uh, have a Docker container, run this for me. I don't really care where this thing is running. Um, Things that abstraction may, makes a lot of sense to just to, to have the runtime. Also, in terms of uh, testing locally, you, you can be sure the uh, what was the, the the good old Docker term and, and sort of this pitch where it it, it, it runs on my it works on my machine uh, or something like that. Right, but you, you can test it locally and you can ship it somewhere else and it works the same way because the runtime is sort of packaged up in the container. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense, um, and that's also really interesting. Projects in in sort of uh, the, the cloud native ecosystem around this, providing a serverless, uh, serverless whatever that means, uh, <laughs> um, platform on top of Kubernetes. Or you can you can hook into the uh, if you are again on a cloud provider, you have the option to actually hook in uh, Fargate or something like that uh, using a project called Virtual Kubelet, where you can hook in these uh, providers and you can schedule your using Kubernetes to schedule your applications to actually execute on a on a serverless uh, container instance somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, yeah, uh, room for, for everything. But, but I think having the container as this, um, that this artifact that you sort of move around makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but the serverless offerings that you mentioned, they all support running a Docker container. 
right? So, for instance, Google App Engine, if you use the standard, <coughs> if you, sorry, if you use the standard uh, type, then you <laughs> you choose a runtime. So you choose Go, or you choose Java, you choose Python in some version that they support. Mm. Uh, but you can also use the flexible engine where, where you just give them a Docker container, then they, they will run for you. And it's the same with, with Fargate. So, so the Docker container is still the unit of execution, if you will. Um, how you orchestrate it, how you schedule it, that's implementation details. Yeah, exactly. But something like Lambda, you 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 can choose to run, uh, let's say, just node something. Uh, but of course, they, that is under under the hood, probably being packaged in the Docker container and executed in some way or form as well. Yeah. But they are sort of managing that runtime. So just having the, the runtime is, uh, is for me at least, it, it's very very nice to have um, compared to the good old <laughs> good old Heroku days where. Well, you made something run locally and then it crashed one when, once you pushed the uh, your old master. Yeah, but if you want to know these, you can also just do. Yeah, probably. You can do it everywhere. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think as for, for a learning platform, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense of running a Kubernetes cluster at home. Yeah. Uh, there's also, there's always something interesting you can spin up uh, at home and say, well, I want to run my own web server or, chat client or whatever Before people run. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Whatever people are running at home. Uh, and it may not be uh, the first cluster you spin up that's the most stable one. <laughs> don't put your don't put your case photos on there. Uh, <laughs> at least back them up as well. Yeah. Um, until you figure out how persistent volumes work. Um, but I think as, as a learning platform it's uh, it's a great thing to run at home. And uh, there are Kubernetes distributions now, right? That are very small, uh, K3D or K3S uh, that you can run on your Raspberry Pi, that you can run on whatever hardware you have lying around. Um, it's definitely become a lot easier. So I, I wrote a masterpiece in 2016 where we built Raspberry Pi clusters, um, Kubernetes Raspberry Pi Kubernetes clusters, and that was the hard way to uh, to make that thing work. Um, Nowadays, it's just uh, yeah, K3S with K3S up ketchup uh, project is out there when you can just point it to an IP address and it will bootstrap the, the Raspberry Pi cluster for you, basically. So uh, it's become a lot easier and it makes a lot of sense to have a, a physical small Raspberry Pi cluster, at least uh, because now you can sort of interact with the uh, introduce failures, uh, pull out a network cable and stuff like that and see what, what is actually going on. It's a really nice um, sort of changeable tool to... Uh, to to understand what is actually going on in in the cloud somewhere, because in the end it's just somewhere else, somebody else's computer, right? Yeah, I think it's also a good platform platform for experimentation, uh, especially if you if you combine it with Helm, which is coming a de facto uh, package manager for running cloud native workloads. So if I want to run a Sonar Cube, I want to run Jenkins, I want to experiment with something new that I haven't uh, haven't done before. Just Helm install and then you then you see it running. Um, I think that's much much easier than you know the old days of uh, apt get install whatever. And then you need to configure stuff. Uh, I think that's a that's a common common abstraction layer that Helm provides that makes it easy to experiment um, and install the things that you need inside the cluster. Yeah, uh, Prometheus or Grafana, whatever you want to install. That, that's that's easy to install because we have Helm. Um, I don't know. You're not the greatest fan of Helm, but, uh, <laughs> but I think it's a good point. it's a good way to run things quickly. Yeah, it is. It really is. Um, that's also if, if now we are talking uh, K it is at home. That's a really nice project out there as well. It's K it is at home. I think uh, the repo is. Um, but but that is actually just Helm chance for how you can run your your home your house on, on top of Kubernetes uh, Home Assistant and all the smart home uh, appliances um, that works really well. So it's just a, uh, yeah, Helm install home assistant and time you need load balance and now you need some Zigbee network or whatever. It's just everything running on a Kubernetes cluster at home. So you can use Kubernetes to control your home if you like. If you're feeling both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like a fun project. Um, so you mentioned the uh, K3S a couple of times. Could one of you just put a few words onto what that actually is? Sure. So uh, it's a tool from Rancher originally, right? Uh, where they took the the big Kubernetes uh, distro, the big Kubernetes uh, GitHub repository, and they cut away everything that's not needed for a minimal cost time. So the the big Kubernetes distro at that point at least came with a lot of integration to different cloud providers and 
how to get a disk from Google and how to get a load balancer from Amazon or whatever, right? And all of this you don't need if you're just running a minimal Kubernetes distro uh, on on a piece of hardware. Yeah. So they cut all that out and they cut out the whole uh, running a etcd distributed database between all of your working nodes. You just embedded a SQLite, SQLite, yeah. SQLite, yeah. SQLite database, uh, and basically removing removing all the not essential stuff from the Kubernetes uh, core uh, and package it up as a very small binary uh, containing everything. Um, a bit like Nomad's philosophy of running everything in, in one binary. Um, and then allowing for a bit of extensibility with plugging in that one load balance I need or English controller or whatever it is. Okay, so and, and is it a stretch to say that the, the stuff that you can do with Kubernetes, you can do on K3S as well. I mean, I mean except the in, let's in, say platform specific things like a uh, load balancer from Amazon or, or or the disk from Google. Yeah, you can still do those as well. You just have to add in the the driver yourself instead of it, instead of Kubernetes coming instead of Kubernetes coming bundled with it. Uh, you can do uh, by now everything you could with a classic Kubernetes cluster. I would say you can do uh, HA and you can still plug in a distributed database uh, to have the, the high performance and high scalability and uh, the, the security of running multiple master nodes and stuff like that. Uh, but you can also just run single node cluster with the master on the worker node and uh, and getting started very fast with running Kubernetes at home or on your one uh, virtual machine or whatever you have. Yeah, and, and if, if that's what you want, there's also other projects out there that kind that makes you run Kubernetes locally again on just in Docker. So the only prerequisite here is, is Docker. So you can you can run Kubernetes in Docker that yeah, it's <laughs> coming an inception, right? But 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 basically it makes it just easy to to run a Kubernetes cluster local on on your machine. And there's multiple other projects out there for getting a local cluster up and running and, and Docker even comes bundled with a cluster if you like as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is is that something you would recommend? Um, I mean, you, you're mentioning that it's good for testing with things locally and running things on your machine, but would you also use that for, let's say, a small scale production environment? Like, let's say you you don't really have users yet, you don't know if it's going to take off, so maybe the full investment in the big Kubernetes, so to speak, maybe you don't know if that's going to pay off. Would would that be a, a viable option? That's your talk, right, Leslie? Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do it with Kind because Kind is really, really focused on ephemeral clusters, and it's, it Kind was built to to run the Kubernetes testing suite. So when the community is building Kubernetes, they run Kind uh, to do their conformance tests. So I wouldn't do that with Kind. Uh, it's so easy to create a cluster and so easy to to destroy the cluster. Um, I, I am running things in, in production with K3s, um, and depending on the project and depending on the Obligations that you have, like, do we need to have 99.999% uptime? Then maybe don't go for K3S with a single master node. And then, <laughs> like, you don't, you don't get high availability with just that one uh, machine, but we, we're not fooling ourselves. We know that I, I, I choose it with open eyes saying I don't really need that highly available system. Uh, and for that, it runs very, very, very well. Um, super lightweight, doesn't take a lot of resources. Really, really stable, I would say. Uh, and it, you don't even need a Docker because now the runtime is container D inside K3S, so which is another container runtime. Um, so I, yes, <laughs> do it for, for, for small projects. Uh, definitely don't use kind for it. I think. Yeah. I think also um, don't, don't use Kubernetes maybe just from the get go. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> focus on actually providing some value uh, for whatever business you're trying to, to do. Uh, Maybe nowadays, again, Docker is, is the standard. Uh, maybe start there uh, because that would make your job a lot easier when you sort of decide to move into a platform like Kubernetes. So to just Dockerizing from start would, would probably be a good idea. Uh, but you don't really need Kubernetes in, in the beginning. Start using some of the uh, the, yeah, the Fargo's and uh, whatever uh, service, serverless containers out there and, and use that. And, and if you at some point need to scale out, you could probably do that on that service as well. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to build your own platform, then probably nowadays use a, a managed service if you want a, a cloud provider and and find a, a good partner if you're on bare metal or something like that, because there's a lot of companies and projects out there that are sort of helping people get up and running on, on bare metal as well. So 
it really depends on the on the scale. But focus on the business and provide the value to the customer before you invest a lot in the, in running Kubernetes. Exactly. Like if you want to have the learning experience of Kubernetes, like what what is the learning experience? The end goal is to run an application, and Kubernetes is just a tool to help me do that. But unless I don't, unless I have the application that I want to run, then Kubernetes doesn't do anything for me. Like I can <laughs> install all these management tools, but in the end, I want to install some app that that helps my end user. Yeah. And when you have that app and you know what you want to build, then you can start picking from the Kubernetes toolbox. Exactly. I think that's uh, that, that's good advice. I think uh, we as an industry tend to get a little bit carried away with the the, the tooling. Really, uh, and there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of hype driven development. I think uh, conference driven development, conference driven development as well, resume driven development too. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I think that's good advice in general. Um, now, just to sort of start wrapping up, one thing I'm wondering is. Um, are there any tools out on the horizon that you're excited about? Like something that's on the way, maybe not quite there yet, or something you're really anxious to just try out? Um, I'm really excited about uh, cross planes, uh, which is uh, building on top of what we talked about before, right? With everything being a resource or a custom resource in, in Kubernetes. Uh, the cross plane people are building uh, basically integrations to every single cloud provider and bare metal provider. So that you can uh, provision all the stuff you need to run your production environment directly from Kubernetes using Kubernetes. You can script all of your infrastructure, defining uh, the YAML files for everything from clusters to databases to load balancers to DNS names and what have you not, and apply that once to Kubernetes and uh, the cross-plane tool will build everything for you. Yeah, and, and one thing to add on, on top of Crossplane is that Crossplane has sort of two levels or sort of two uh, customers, so to speak. They have the, the end user, the sort of the application engineer, um, and we have the platform engineer that are sort of defining what it means to create a database. And the, the cool thing about Crossplane is that you can compose uh, and sort of provide different levels of abstraction. So for the application engineer, you can say the only thing they care about is storage for a database, right? And then as a platform engineer, you probably need to or want to have some control of where is this database actually running? Is it publicly, does it have a public endpoint or is it whatever it might be? Um, so you can actually pick and choose and, and sort of select what kind of uh, values that you will expose for the developer. So they have this really nice uh, uh, composability strategy, which is really cool. So yeah, I'm definitely on Crossplane as well and, and Trust API as we already talked about. Um, yeah, it, it allows the infrastructure team to create a tailored abstraction for, for the application developers. Yeah, and actually for each cloud as well. So for the developer, a uh, Postgres SQL instance, uh, it, you really probably don't care if it runs and where it runs. Um, so you can actually also abstract that away to the multiple cloud. So if you're multi-cloud and all that, so then look at a crossplane. It's a cool tool. You can also create clusters with crossplane if you want. So it's... Yeah, <laughs> where's, where's the starting cluster, right? Yeah. There needs to be one cluster that you start off with. Exactly. To everything. Yeah. Um, I was thinking of another, so I want to go in another direction. I'm really excited about uh, about NATS at the moment, which is a, a new cloud-native uh, message queue built from uh, Synadia, I think the company's called. Um, it's really, really cool. It can do clustering, it can do mutual TLS, it can do authentication. Like, if you... <laughs> If you think about the complexity of running Kafka, for instance, I think Nets is a super lightweight to get most of the most of the capabilities of Kafka, even persistent uh, consumers now and persistent uh, queues, for very very little cost and very very little operational complexity. It is super fast and it's built in Go, of course, like <laughs> all good tools are. Uh, I think I'm really excited about Nets. That I'm using that on a project now and it's been really really stable. Um, and can offer a lot of uh, performance at uh, a very, very little resource cost. Nice. Yeah. And you can do end-to-end encryption with NATS? Yes. And I think they recently added support for MQTT, so you can use it to ingest things from IoT devices now. From your home. From your home, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and they also recently added uh, support for WebSocket, so you can, and they have uh, all sorts of crazy... Uh, Come uh, concepts they can do now 
uh, leaf nodes, they call it. So you have a node that you expose publicly that sort of becomes part of your Nets cluster, but it's it's managed differently. So you can run that and you can actually expose that on the internet. So you have a web socket from an app to a, a leaf node that can then talk to the to the master nodes in the behind the firewalls. Yeah, Nets super cool. Definitely, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I think that's uh, roughly what I wanted to cover and we are running out of time, but it was a pleasure to chat with all three of you. I feel like you could have gone on for a couple more hours if you had some beers <laughs> on the table. Uh, so let's do that next time. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech for lots more content from the brightest minds in software development. Thank you.